Good morning, good morning. I'm on one of my number. Oh, have I? What's up, y'all? I can't even get the words out this morning. Doing them on, on my, uh, I guess, early 4th of July walk, and then I'm going to run after I get these thoughts off of my head. So hold on a second, y'all. All right, good morning. What's up? I know many of you probably out and about doing your thing, but, uh, I just wanted to share some thoughts. Y'all know, you know, uh, I am Rico the Opinionist. I have opinions about everything. So if you can hear me, let me know. If you cannot hear me, let me know. Uh, uh, and also, while you're, while you're on this page, check out the description box. I have a lot of goodies on here. If you have not bought my Father's Day book, I'm sorry, short story, it's only 40 pages. Hit your boy with the $10 cash app. It's called The Greatest Pain Ever Felt. Conversation with the absent biological father who never wanted to be found. Actually, pretty decent. It's still for sale. Cash app, PayPal, 10 bucks. Please send me an email address so I can send it to you because I have it like in PDF form. <sighs> but anyway, uh, the conversation continues across social media uh, as relates to a young woman, Shakaria Shakari Richardson. And uh, this is pretty much like an, uh, an offset of, of that topic because as far as I'm concerned, her situation for me is over. Good morning, Dewey. He says, what's up, Cope? It was spot on that last live. I hate I missed the initial broadcast. It's cool, brother. So sit tight and let this let this hit you. Yeah, you. So uh, as far as I'm concerned, that whole that whole thing is uh, I've kind of moved on from that. But what I tend to do is take uh, some pieces of of what's being said in the in in, in a particular situation and kind of expound on it, right? And what her situation turns comes down to be is accountability and uh one thing about it we've all given this young lady credit and she deserves it she said i knew what i did i knew i was breaking the rules i did it and i don't know how come we met a lot of us missed that part or we didn't concentrate on the importance of taking accountability we went straight to why and i hope i addressed why in the last live i did on this topic you know, let's go and treat whatever motivated her to do this, to per no, to almost this almost sabotage her entire her career potentially. Instead, I'm hearing people talking about weed. You know, even though it's an edible that she that she uh, ingested, people are talking about weed, and all of a sudden we have all these weedologists, and everyone's so proficient in how marijuana uh, impacts the body and the brain. And again, I taught the class, we'll continue to teach the class, maybe next year or so, about or educate on marijuana. I'm not an expert, but, you know, but I think I like to think after more than 10 years or so of teaching that class, I learned a few things over the years. And one thing about it, I had, I, it takes me to a debate I had with a client in one of my marijuana dependence classes or brief counseling for marijuana dependence groups, right? Education groups. She said, man, when I smoke some weed now, she's in the class on probation. She said, I said when I smoke some weed, I get up and I can vacuum the whole house. It is a stimulant. And and I had I had to share with her that Marijuana is not a stimulant, but what it does is give you that sense of euphoria. It gives you that sense of ease and calm. What makes you get up and say, you know what? I can get up and do this. But after a while, even that calms down. I hope the wind is not blocking out my message. Uh, and so, again, people use drugs of any form to change our mood and alter our reality. It weed or whatever. And I want to say this to LeVar Ball's uh, LaMelo. And I think Mr. LeVar Ball walks on the moon. I appreciate him being that, that protective masculine father. And I think, I'm, I don't know very much about LaMelo, but he put out a, a, 
a tweet in support of Shikari and he's saying that, you know, she should be able to participate. And, she, and he said, well, a lot of people are saying if it's not crack, uh, if it's not crack, she should be able to run track. And so this is the same conversation that I've had for decades with clients about drug use. And the reason, one of the main reasons we don't look at weed as being detrimental in our lives is because of the stigma attached to other drugs. And I have to take it, walk it slow, and tell them, look, yeah, of course you're not going to admit to being a drug addict because it makes you no, know, in, 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 in comparison to crack or meth or uh, heroin or pills, because weed is so socially accepted. I mean, it's been popularized by all kinds of folks. Even back in the 20s and 30s, some of our jazz greats smoked marijuana. But one thing about marijuana, especially, particularly when we're talking about the THC and the high content of that, you know, look at Snoop Dogg. That dude ugly as fuck. And I would tell, you know, from uses, from years of smoking weed. And I would always say, young ladies, Y'all stop smoking weed because weed makes you ugly. It does. Get around a weed smoking chick who smoke weed at the dependence level, smoke blunts every day or smoke blunts every weekend. She is not pretty like she was last summer. And I would always warn my young ladies in my group, you continue to smoke weed, you're not going to be this cute next summer. Because it's just like any other drug. It takes away from your body, the body's natural uh, uh, production of so you name the hormones and all this stuff that keeps us youthful and, and keeps our skin soft and, and supple and it just eats up all the vitamin E <clears throat> and vitamin C and all of that stuff when you're doing a consistent drug. But, so, but that's, that's the debate <laughs> that I've had with clients over the years. And after a while, they, they say, you know what, that makes sense. So I'm hearing this same conversation with people all over talking about weed. Or edibles, however, whatever form you want to take it in. Because, see, it was edibles that she used. <clears throat> so, uh, and I would explain to them, well, one thing about it, I would do an example. See, weed is a, is a, it's a depressant like alcohol. Alcohol even gives you that sense of, I can do it. While you're on a dance floor, you hit that henny, you hit that crown, you hit your favorite liquor, and you out there, man... Out there killing it. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, uh. Yeah. Uh, 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 uh. you killing it. And next thing you know, you sitting your ass at, <laughs> at the table, slobbing out your mouth, sleep. Because it's all, it, it works like sugar. Sugar gives you that temporary burst of energy. <sighs> and next thing you know, it, there's a crash that comes after that. Weed does the same thing. Prime example. They smoking weed. A lot of folks, I mean, I guess when I was smoking it, and yes. In, in college in 1990. Uh, last time, yeah, last time I smoked weed was March of 19, was that March, March of 1996. And I haven't looked back because after 96, we got people looking and sounding like slow moving crack addicts. I'm going to tie all this up. Uh, I don't know what they're putting in it since 96, 97, 98 up until now. But y'all can have this shit. Good morning, Tito. Y'all can have it. And so, what it does is, I would say, look, okay. The reason a lot of people are trying to take it easy on weed, because the crash and the destruction takes a lot longer than crack and meth. See, um, this is how it is. Let me stand still so y'all can see this. This is why I tell my clients. Okay, you on crack. Here's your fall. Boom. Boom. You're on heroin. Boom. Boom. You're on what else? Crack, meth, heroin. You're on meth. Boom. Boom. You're on weed. Da da. Da da da. Da 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 da. Da, 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 then boom. See, it dilly dallas before you hit that crash on weed. And also, weed, you be fucking around sitting in a garbage pile, you still like, damn. Man, how the fuck I get around here? Man. 
That's weed. Even your alcohol. People said they're functioning alcoholics. Yeah. <clears throat> but we know what gets the alcoholics? That broken, that, that blood, that bloody liver, that worn out liver, messed up heart, or you hurt yourself on the job. So people say, well, use things responsibly. Well, you do. You have to use them responsibly, but also <sighs> it depends on who you are. Addiction is inevitable in a lot of cases because you can get become what's called dependent on that feeling. That's the feeling that gets us caught up. Let me tell you something about a drug that allows you a second chance to get away. It's called heroin. Based on the years I've worked with, worked with clients in residential treatment, I hear their stories. They, and uh, Most of them will always say, you know, when I hit heroin for the first time, smoking it or what have you, I got sick as a dog. That is the drug saying, hey, you don't want this smoke. Go ahead. But you know what? They said, I went back and I tried it again. And then, bing, ding, 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 that bell went off. And I've been chasing that bell ever since. The same thing with crack. Bing, ding, 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 that bell goes off. And so, heroin has to give you a chance to get away. But see, your ego and your pride runs you back to heroin. And next thing you know, you're looking stupid for the next six months or six years or 16 years. Out of, you know, out of clothes, out of mind, out of your soul, and out of everything. Fuck with that heroin. Come on, somebody. So accountability you know and i'm you, you you're speaking or well, i'm coming from a flawed perspective i'm a flawed person i've made i've made mistakes i've done things said things i regret and all of this so i'm not coming from a place of perfection i'm always coming from a place of practice you hear me practice meaning trying to get better every day but still I have room and I have the right to express my thoughts on any topic that's public. And especially when it's in my field of substance abuse. And so we're hearing all this conversation. I've even heard, seen and read what people are trying to do the comparison to the swimmer Michael Phelps. Michael Phelps was never, never tested positive. When you go and do the research, I said, let me read this. because I remember his whole controversy, but let me go and reread it. Michael Phelps was never tested. There was a picture of him at a party. That man was going in with a bong. And he, he was suspended for three months. And he lost his Kellogg cereal endorsement, among other things. This young lady tested positive. After she said, I knowingly did it. No, she did it. And it's okay. I mean, I mean, it's not okay that she did it. What I'm saying is, it's good that she came forward, right? And she's even going to get to run again. Uh, in the 400, 4 by 4, 400 meter relay, she's going to do that. And so don't try to compare her to Michael Phelps. It's two different situations, you know, in my opinion. Because you know, somebody come up with something. Because we're always trying to make a, you know, there's a case for racism, a case for no. Because one thing about racism, and we haven't learned now, it's systematic. Unless we're going to get missiles, unless we're going to get grenades, tanks, and do what you do to take down a system. Because cussing in the streets and burning down buildings where you live, that doesn't take down systems. It, that just leaves you assed out in your neighborhood. Uh, unless we're going to do that, you have to go by what our elders and our parents taught us. Look, there's a hole right there. So you make sure you be mindful to walk around it. But when you jump in the hole, you don't say, man, somebody put a hole right here. Man, it's so fucked up. Man, they ain't have to do it like that. They told you ahead of time that there was a hole. And so that's what this thing's about. We already know about racism, but why, why, do, we, why do so many of us still can continue to participate? I know we can go on and on about this. And I'm not trying to minimize it. I'm just saying there's so many. There's, we, if we could just collectively concentrate on some things that we can change. You know, that serenity prayer, speaking of substance abuse. And it says, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to, to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Meaning, let's get to the stuff that we can change. 
But we have because we have we have yet to participate as a collective of black people in this country. To all 46 million of us, 44 million of us to the things that we can change. Let me tell you all something. If we began the process of collectively changing things we can change, like out of wedlock births, fatherlessness, these lame ass public schools that that we continue to send our children to and they get miseducated or or programmed into a bunch of foolishness. We can change that collectively. We sure can't raise a lot of money for political parties, but we can't blame raise a lot of money to put our kids in decent schools. And, and, and build a neighborhood. We love to talk about Black Wall Street, but we act like we're scared to do it. We got over 40 million blacks. I know all of us are not on the same page, but how come 10 million of us can't get together and put $5 up a month? Y'all see, a lot of this so racism can be, <laughs> it can be challenged, but we're so messed up that we don't even believe in who we are. And I question, I question 97% of everybody black that call themselves a Christian. Well, how are you going to believe in God? You don't believe in yourself. Come on, somebody. Good morning, Nancy. See, that God thing is something that's not a reality. But your suffering or your pleasure or your pain, those are realities that you can be dealing with. But we'd rather put it in the law's hands. We not even have a clear cut of who and what that is. So, back black and accountability, what seems to be the disconnect? We, I mean, I read a lot of this stuff. I like, come on, it's not that deep. Some people say, "Well, black women aren't even allowed to run track and all this." I'm like, okay, great. When I didn't know, uh, now y'all want to remember history when it's convenient. You know, <laughs> you know, I appreciate Shakari setting the example of taking ownership, but her defenders are not taking ownership. Her defenders want to talk about, you know. We shouldn't be banned. Look, rules are rules, goddammit. Damn. If that's the case, of folks who drive with DUIs have a lot to complain about. Yeah, goddammit. Why these folks pulling me over and giving me a ticket and shit give me five to ten years, man, for my fourth DUI, man? Because it's against the rules to drive while under the influence of alcohol. That's why you're getting... <laughs> that's why you're getting the consequence. I mean, we can go down the gamut. Man, I came in here, I ran out this store, a handful of clothes. Why are these folks trying to stop me at the door? Because it's against the rules to shoplift, you son of a bitch. That's why they're stopping you. And she understood. Regardless of what we think about the system, it is in place unless we're going to go above and beyond to change it. You know, don't, don't try to minimize and, and have a conversation all around it. Let's stop it. Rules. Rules. But you know what? Look at our society. Look at the black race. There aren't too many rules being followed. That's why we have a lot of disorder. You know, there are rules against killing. But don't stop people from doing it. And a lot of times they're not held accountable. They're only particular people. It's the weirdest thing. It's rules. But we don't seem to have a... We don't seem to have a connection to that. And I'm going to say this, ladies, close your ears. The reason that a lot of rules are not really take it, uh, taking account against. <laughs> the reason, the reason that there's so much disorder and, and like a, uh, an actual um, minimizing of the rules because the black race for the last 40 years, 50 years, has been under what is called a gynocracy, a matriarchal rule. We're being ran by women. And when and when have y'all known women en masse? So women as a group been very organized or follow the rules. They go under the, because women and girls go under the, the, the guise or the vestige of coddling and entitlement. Entitled people don't like to follow the rules. Coddled people don't know what rules are. Privileged people 
don't know what rules are. That's why you have all these sisters around here like, well, she should be able to run. And these old beta male bitch ass dude, man, she should be ain't nothing but weed. It ain't crack. What the fuck y'all talking about? What, what does that have to do with the price of tea in China? I'm sorry. Let me do my Trump. In China. Nothing. We need to cut the immaturity out. Stop it. Yeah, if you don't like the rules, goddamn it, fight. Let me tell y'all something. Let me, let me add something else in this really quickly, if I may. Isn't it interesting that we're trying to minimize what a drug is because, because we want to support her and all this, and that's great. But you know who, you know who's not defended or the conversation is not minimized when this group of people break the rules? Men. I'm going to give you all a case right here. Whenever a man breaks the rules or not pay child support, how many of these same women come out and say, you know what, he ain't have no job. You know what, that woman just there trying to hurt him. You know what, y'all need to change the laws. Y'all don't hear no outpouring of celebrities and shit. Y'all don't hear no outpouring of masses of black women and beta male dudes. Man, he need to pay his mother child support. That's what you hear. The men are supposed to suffer all of the consequences when they don't pay no damn child support. Now, do you hear talk? Do you hear talk of people trying to break down or tear down the child support system? Hell no. Because it benefits women. Y'all not even hearing me, are you? See, men, I made a comparison earlier. Michael Phelps seemed to have gotten a harsher sentence. He was a man. This young lady got one month and said going to get the run. Female. I've taken race out of it. Until we understand, America is pushing masculinity out the window. And, and, it get, and it's applying women with stiletto heels to put the foot in, your, in men's asses to help push them out. And they're raising these old beta male soft ass boys under the gynocracy the matriarchal society that America wants because it's all about controlling the people. You get rid of the men, you get rid of logic, you get rid of masculinity, you have what, what you have now is chaos and excuses. That's what you have. I'm sorry, you have what's called the Biden-Harris administration. You got all kinds of foolishness. Inclusive. Bullshit. That's what's going on. And so I like to see I like to see these same people that want the right to be a drug addict. Cause that's what you are. When you smoke weed every day, you smoke crack every day. When you smoke crack every day, what you call a drug addict. When you do heroin every day, you call a drug addict. When you drink look every day, you call an alcoholic, drug addict. When you smoke weed every day, you you you're still not that same fucking drug addict. It has the same physical and psychological effects. And there, and there are some benefits to it. You know, to my folks who are cancer survivors, my folks who are going through pain from other, you no, know, my elderly people. But a young person around here smoking blunts every day? What a waste. Take your silly ass to counseling. A young person under the age of 50? You're out here getting high every day? That's issues. Yeah, and then, you know, when my clients used to tell me, I'm going back and forth, but y'all follow me here. Yeah? I have clients say, you know what, Mr. Rico, man, doctors and lawyers, doctors and lawyers smoke weed, man, or eat edibles or whatever. I say, you know what, they can do that. They're doctors and lawyers. Why don't you get your ass off probation and become a doctor and a lawyer? Then you can smoke weed on the weekend on your yacht, too. But guess what? Doctors love to snort cocaine, too. And guess what? One of, the, one of those surgeries, they're going to mess around and sew in a gauze an ink pen or a notebook in somebody's goddamn chest and they're going to not only lose their license, they practice, they're going to jail. So it all, it usually has a rough ending. So I don't do this compare and comparison kind of stuff when I'm talking to drug addicts. Because there's no room for giving a pass to a drug addict. There's no room for that. And if you're in my field or if you're, if you're in recovery, to my folks, shout out to my people who are in recovery from well, they want to say harder drugs. You know, they know what I'm talking about. Those folks who battled and struggled with drugs. They'll tell you, there's no, there's no, there's no space 
for for passes given to because every every drug addict needs any reason, any reason to use. It don't take much. Oh my God, the sun is shining. Let me go get fucked up. Go, 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 go. And ah, 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 ah. Any reason to do. And but you know what's very interesting? Insurance doesn't pay for those who are addicted to marijuana to receive treatment. You have to be an alcoholic or hard on those pills, hard on crack or meth and stuff like that. But you can't. They don't. They won't pay for marijuana addiction. And it's clearly an addiction. But they don't use the word addiction. They like to say marijuana dependence. It's still addiction. And anytime you risk your life, your wife your children, your freedom to smoke a blunt. That is an addiction. And the one thing I don't do is have these companies, well, you know, man, it ain't worse than that. I don't, I don't do that. I don't play that game. What's up, Mike? Mike C. I don't play that game. I've been in it too long. And as one who suffered with alcohol abuse in the past, I understand. And I know, and I know why I drink. You know, just like her, you know, anger, depression, all of that. I know why I drank heavily and I was drunk from shit in the 90s from Wednesday to Sunday night. Sunday morning, I'm sorry. Cause the club closed. Depends on which club I went to. If it was a black club, it closed at 2. If it was a mixed club, whites, blacks, and everybody, it closed usually at 4 to 6 o'clock in the morning. And I was staggered out there, mama. Got behind the wheel and everything. Greg McCart drunk. So I understand all of that. It wasn't until like 2002 that I started getting it together. You got to go to counseling for these things and find out what motivates the use. Now, there are those of us in our society who recreationally use alcohol, recre recreationally use weed every once in a while. <laughs> like, did you say what's cracking? Really? <laughs> That's good, bro. And on the morning, we're talking about crack and weed and all that. That's funny. But yeah. And so, look, and that's why, and that's why I didn't give her any leniency in that regard. But I, but I recognize her humanity. Because people say, well, she was mourning her mother. She was mourning this. I, I get it. I get it. But when we teach in, uh, in substance abuse treatment, what I taught my clients, <sighs> grief, anger, of the grief from the death of a family member, friend, or loved one, that is still not a reason to self-sabotage. But, but people have to be taught this. So that's why I suggested in my last live that I hope that she goes and receives counseling so that can be dealt with, so that won't be another, a, a future motivating factor for whenever she gets sad, whenever she gets bored, or she gets anxious or afraid. These are, it is our... Uh, our mental health, our emotional well-being that drives us to want to change our mood and alter our reality. Get it? So, but we're going to skip the accountability part. Well, you need to change it, this. So, <laughs> come on, y'all. Let's be mature. Let's have some accountability in our society. No, in our race. Because there's so much going on. Can I share something else with y'all while I'm talking? Speaking of this this whole meteorical gynocracy. Uh, and I was going to do a separate video on this because I didn't want this to be too long. But I guess it's on my mind right now and, uh, and I'll learn how to chop these videos up in the future. So if you continue to listen, I have something else. This, this happened yesterday, right? I was in the environment, you know, and uh, young men were playing football, right? Young black boys. And, uh, one got pushed too hard, though, it broke out in a fight, and they broke the fight up. I mean, he was extremely angry. I'm talking about to the point, it's almost like they couldn't even break the dude up. They couldn't calm him down. Y'all know that's a bunch of fe female feminine behavior. A lot of these boys, let me get to that in a second. He kept yelling this phrase, and we've all heard it, but I don't think we've given really deep thought and uh, dissection of this statement. He was so mad, he was beating his chest because he had his shirt off. He was like, I swear for God, on my mama, 
on my mama. Did I just tell y'all about this gynocracy? About this matriarchy? See, when there's no men around, the first thing you tell something, the first thing I heard, my like, why you talking about some on my mama? Where's this daddy? And I do. Whenever I see every other black female with, with, walking with children, I, was, I always ask myself in my head, where is that child? I wonder if that child has a father. Well, you look at statistics, 80% of black children are born as single mothers. So you can't help but. It's not a stereotype. It's almost like a common question. Where is that child's father? And guess what? You can tell these boys who don't grow up with dads. You can tell that. <laughs> Just by the way they act, where they carry themselves. And, and this was a whole event of young black athletes playing football. That seemed to be the go-to, you know, when you can't do it, when you don't offer counseling, anger, whatever, you want to stick them all in football and basketball and shit. Well, all right, it's almost how, how the plantation owner bred the, sl the male slaves. You bred them physically, but you don't touch them emo develop, you know, developmentally, emotionally, mentally. You just have them bred physically. And that's what we messed around and started doing as it seemed like the only solution to what do we do with these boys who are not growing up with fathers. Let's stick them in sports. But then y'all could see on social media these same black athletes that were stuck in sports. Look at the decisions that they're making with their money. Look at the decisions that they're making with their penis. Multiple baby mamas, you got millions of dollars. Are you insane? See, we are going to have to stop. Kevin Jackson, good morning, brother. We're going to have to start concentrating on ourselves in the sense of being solution, meaning being solution oriented. And that young man screamed to the high heavens. This is not the first time I've heard black boys out of anger, meaning, oh, my mama, like... And then, then don't forget, on oh, my dead grandmama. You know, you'll never hear on oh, my dead grandfather, on oh, my daddy, on oh, my daddy. They don't have them. And I blame the women for that. And he said, Rico, man, you be coming down on the women. Why not? They're the only group, shout out to Sister Sherazad Ali, that has never been examined. Sherazad Ali said this back in 89, 90. The black woman has yet to be examined thoroughly. But we'll rip apart a man and a black boy all day long with, with impunity. And everybody seems to say, it's okay with it. Nobody seems to say, hey, lay off black men. Hey. Oh. Well, as soon as you say one small thing, oh my God, black, let black women live. Oh my God, they're attacking black women. He hates black women. That shit is so over. And so they say these things and no and it doesn't seem to raise red flags when people when these boys say this. And that to me that's very concerning. It's indicative of the society we live in. And then also we can say, well, who's to blame for this? Well, you know, it's all about money. Did y'all know, if you haven't known, that Saks Fifth Avenue plays ten billion dollars over ten years? For the development or the empowerment of black women, not the black family. Then some people say, well, black men, what you going to do about it? I mean, what the fuck you supposed to do about it? Except for, all right. Like the MGTOW brothers say, shit, I'm going to go my own way. Y'all keep accepting this money, this blood money from your white zaddy. You keep accepting this money from these white feminists who keeps you and, and you ending up at home alone while she got a husband at home, Gloria Steinem and all of them. And you going home. Barely 20, 26% married, going against your nature as a woman just because you sin. Black men are oppressing you. When, where they do that at? So what are we going to do about this? These black boys in the absence of black men as their fathers. And I know a lot of you say, well, Lord, if these men are leaving their kids. No, they're not. Hi, good morning. How are you? They're not. And I know who don't leave their children at a large rate. Husbands, how come there's never black women's a lot of black women who do get to yelling this stuff? How come they never say, We well, you know my husband left me? You rarely hear that. Now, I'm not saying that, that during the divorce, the husband say, You know what, this bride is tripping, I don't want to be there, or he gets so mad that he and, that, and it happens, but that's not the big issue. And I keep saying, Husbands don't leave at the high rate that. One night stands do, because we have to also admit that black children 
are mainly born out of one night stands, out of hookups. They're not born out of planning and love and relationships. They're born out of sex and screwing. Until we start being honest about our behavior, our behavior, shout out to Tommy Brown, our behavior, and I've always been one who focused on behavior. He's correct. You know, until we start looking at that, we're going to keep playing these games and keep losing, coming last in all the statistics. It's us. We got 40 million of us. Yeah, racism should always be dealt with, but there's some things we can do under the guise. On while in this. If you believe that racism is a reality, you believe that white supremacy is a reality, well, how come we don't behave like that? You would think that the so people who believe that racism is uh, prevalent and and just all going, all so pervasive. <laughs> you would think that we're trying to gather as many things as we can to make our own. But we don't. Man, it's racist, it's racist. Then we go back to doing things that almost helps out the racism. We don't come together, you know, and build. Black colleges are closing, not because of just racism, they're closing because black people don't even want to send their kids. You know what I'm saying? Black people don't even send their children there. You can't have a business without customers. Damn. And then they tell, well, black colleges don't have this. Well, you send more kids there, the quality will improve. Those white schools got all this slave insurance money. They got all this stuff. And then you go and take, you volunteer to take your black body there and give them more money. Obviously, we don't care about history in that regard unless we're talking about the cops, I guess. So, yeah, oh, my mama. Damn. Oh, my dead grandma. And I mean, those are really war words, fighting words. And that's a dangerous thing. We will have to normalize fatherhood again. But no, for fatherhood to be normalized, the women have to take have to take the stance on that. Teach these young girls just because you have a vagina at 15 doesn't mean a baby is supposed to come out of it. This is 2021, not 1721. Why aren't women talking to young girls? And whenever somebody like me, a masculine heterosexual man, speaks about it, oh my God, he hates his mother. Girl, he gay. Man, what's wrong? He hates women. He hates black women. You know, that shit is so old. We're over it, ladies. We're over it. And you beta male simps, we've been over you punk ass dudes. So, <laughs> we, we're having a conversation. We're taking the conversation to you. The end of, uh, in the end of fatherlessness is on the laps of women. Yeah, it's not the men. It's the women. Because did y'all know that can't no man get no cooch without no permission? And the woman makes all the choices. All right, I mean, I'm going to be a baby mama. I'm going to be a wife. And a lot of women have opted out, according to the statistics, to be baby mamas instead of wives. But then you want to complain about you making a choice to be a baby mama. <laughs> Don't tell me what the man ought to do. He can't do none unless you agree to it. Did y'all know that? I mean, it's 2021. We've been talking about this it's since, whoo, the 70s. I know in the 90s we talked about it when I was a young man. We're still talking about this. You know why? Because women have never been called to the carpet. And guess what? The, all these black women who are famous, they're not going to call each other out. They're not going to put money towards changing the mindset of how... <clears throat> Black women view motherhood because America wants black women to be single mothers. Because when there are no families, that leaves the black race vulnerable. Damn. I'm not even a Christian. I don't even have a religion. How come I got more sense than religious people? Damn. The number one thing is not economics, it's family. Family, people. Family. You have to have into my religious folks. Hell, even your Bible says mother, father, child. And to my black conscious folks out there, we want to deal with the divine and, and uh, divinity and all of that, it still says mother, father, child. Then in reality, you got mama and mama, or just mama, mama and her stud girlfriend. We got all kinds of stuff that don't make any sense. But everybody's dipped in the blood and that Lord and Savior Jesus Christ because they confessed it with their mouth and, and confessed it in their heart and they believe it in their hearts. Man. It's, it don't make any sense. Hold on, let me get across here real quick. Doesn't make any sense. And so, but we're going to get it together. Look, when God was giving out sense, 
I guess I stayed in line. I didn't take a smoke break or a, or a lunch break. I stayed until I got my piece of sense. I think a lot of folks stepped out the line to take smoke breaks or blunt breaks. You know, because this doesn't make any sense. Our race shouldn't be this messed up in 2021. We shouldn't be. But we refuse to invest in something that was given to us. That is us. I don't care what it is. But see, all the famous people with the huge platform, they come out with stuff that doesn't benefit us. They don't come out and, and, and spend their millions of dollars on say, hey, we're going to put some programs to make sure black girls understand that, hey, he can't have no kid unless we've been married at least two years. I'm not having any children. Also, teaching black females, don't nobody want no old chick in her 30s talking about, I want a husband right now. And you done ran, you have ridden the car carousel all through your 20s and your early 30s. Now you're 34 years old with a law degree. Ain't no dude that's worth his salt want no old chick that's been ran through. I don't care if you got a nursing degree. I don't care if you're a judge or whatever. Ain't nobody fooling with you. Ladies, when we're young and fine is when you're supposed to. That's when you get the most attention. When you're young and fine, you're under a size 10. Yeah, but, you, but, but I'm not saying you can't get married and find love. There's a lot of dudes with low self-esteem and take what they can get. So, shout out to those because they, they say somebody for everybody. You know, and, and, and so, but that's work that men have to do. We have to redirect a lot, a lot of our guys' behaviors. So it goes, it's still under this, this matriarchy, this gynocracy, and it goes under black accountability. When are we going to take accountability for our race? And I don't have a problem with saying race. I know a lot of you, you know, interracially married, got mixed kids and all that, but that's your issue. It's not mine. And I don't mistreat or disrespect anybody who's decided to use another strategy in order to survive under white supremacy. You know, because I look at all that stuff as a strategy, you know, to survive or try to <laughs> pretend it's where you don't live at by, by, by going that route. Uh, what what'd you say, Mike? Mike says, we're still under the spell of religion. Once our people get from under this sorcery, all of the madness will be uplifted. Yeah. I mean, it's so many things. You know, we can go into the imagery that we volunteer to participate in. It's, and I don't want to go too far off. Because my main goal was to have a conversation about why is there such a, a, seems to be such a disconnect between being black and accountability in this country. It's the weirdest thing. And please don't tell me what other people are doing. You know, man, white people do this. Why? Who gives a shit? Who cares? I guarantee you, if you concentrate on what you're supposed to do, what we can do, Put our money together. Come on. If we put, if we, I, let me tell y'all again. If we concentrate and pool our money, our billions of dollars, into building the actual black nation. Hey, I know I'm sounding stupid. This is the kind of stuff to keep people like me poor. Worrying about what's going on with my race. It does. When I don't give a damn, it's like people who don't really give a damn about our race. They do really well. They, 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 make, they make all the money. I don't know. I said, well, damn, I need, maybe I need to get famous. Because me being just a regular guy, man, ain't reaching nobody. I don't even care about it. So, look, I was too short to play basketball. I was never big and strong enough to play football, in my opinion. Or it looked like it hurt or something. So I, I, I didn't get famous. But, you know, some of us who are not famous, we know what we're talking about. You know, some of us who are not rich, we know what we're talking about, but I guess we know so much because we don't have very much to lose. And it's funny when people, I guess, get rich and say, well, I don't want to lose it. Well, put some of it away and then, you know, I don't know. You'll deal with that. But we're going to have to deal with this. This whole matriarch matriarchy that was created and and, and it's currently being funded. Single motherhood is funded by the government. It's funded by entities. It's funded by white corporations. Single motherhood in the black community is funded. And sisters don't seem to have any problems with accepting the money because they've been almost completely convinced that family is not important. Family. Do I need to say that again? Family. 
then people are like, well, Rico, what about you? Well, what about me? I'm not married. Guess what? I don't have any bastard kids either. See, that's that's the way I contribute it. I didn't bring any kids here without a father, without a, you know, without me being a dad or, well, I didn't bring any kids here unwanted. A lot of these kids here are unwanted. And then let me go back to what I'm saying about what I was saying about how we need to get these boys out of this emotional state. And this is a feminine behavior. A lot of these, look at these teenage boys. They act like girls because they're raised by girls. And these mamas that try to be, play hard, see, we don't understand the importance of the study of psychology. You know, psychology deals with the development through a lifespan or psychological functioning of the brain or the functioning of the brain. We don't respect that. A lot of stuff we do with little black children, it's just unreal. We, we, we act as if these people are not going to grow up into a lot of folks that we're complaining about today. That boy beating his chest, oh my mama, oh my dead mama, my swear for God, oh my mama. That was disturbing. And I'd heard that before, but somebody, it hit me. I said, that's disturbing for him to say that, for these black boys to say that. Why is it they have such a, just a, oh my God, like a worshiping loyalty to their mothers, and but but it's so easily to attack their fathers. You know what's going around in this video of this actor who played in the new movie of Superfly, I never saw it, but he's he, he's uh, had a conversation with Dr. Umar Johnson. And he had another conversation, I guess, with somebody else. But he was talking about how his mother beat him, uh, verbally abused him, and always told him his daddy won nothing. And he grew up at age 26 and found out his daddy was actually a pretty cool dude. Y'all had those mothers. Why don't, why don't we need more men to tell these stories? And also, man, we need to teach our young men, your penis is not your pathway to manhood. It's your pathway to either debt or death. We got to teach these black boys that. Because we have to literally break the spell of the Leviathan. Y'all Google that, what a Leviathan is. Please Google Leviathan. Because a lot of these, a lot of our, our race and a lot of our black boys are under the spell of, a Levi of the Leviathan. We have to deprogram these boys. You don't have to be, you know, and I guess, and some people say, well, well you know, it's all you ever had with his mama. Well, who, who made that choice? He didn't have to just have his mama and his grandma. When I see these pictures, generations of women, what are men at? How do you think these women came about? Somebody had to shoot some semen somewhere. And we just sit around like this shit is normal. It's not cool. Whenever I see a picture of a number of women, what are men at? Where the granddad at? What a great grandfather. We always show with well, a great grandmother she lived, my grandmother, then my mother, then my daughter. Where the hell are the fathers? Where the dudes? Where the brothers at? And and uh like Judge Joe Brown says, and like Kwame, like what well, men are talking about, even Dr. T.S. Son Johnson, he's talking about black masculinism. You know, Judge Joe Brown said recently in the podcast with Kwame Brown, he was saying, you know, you got two daughters, you got a son and two daughters, but you're saying, the, or was it Kwame that said this? Which has been pointed out, I'm sure, but he reiterated and is good for this generation. You have you, you make sure you get your daughters the scholarships to make sure they get the jobs while you while you, you got your daughters the black girl magic and all this shit, but your son just sitting there. You got nothing for him. And then let's talk about really quickly. You know, when these sisters say, Well, you know, we're the most enrolled in college. I mean, uh, we're the most educated. You know why? And let's go back if y'all wanna look at history. The men have always done the men have always been in their roles as hunter gatherers, protector providers. Yeah, they sent the women out to be educated while the boys stayed, while the men stayed home and worked the fields. So, of course, you're more enrolled because it's almost expected for you to go. We, I think guys had to be convinced. You can go to college, too, bro. But see, guys are usually, you know, like Kwame is talking about, pushing trades, trade schools. That's how men got their six figures. You know, uh, high five figures. High six-figure jobs, plumbing, electrician, contracting, uh, 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 construction, engineering. They did that stuff. That's, what, that's, a, that's the living that got us over. But now, <laughs> the boys have been talked out of trades. And you wonder why the stuff is going on. That stuff is real. Voltaire is in school for a reason. A lot of those guys in the 70s and 80s 
who learned how to do welding, who fixed on cars, who learned all that stuff, learned it in high school because they had a program called Botech. They used to leave the school. We have the, the, uh, the school bell ring at 7.30 after homecoming. Around uh, right after the first period, a lot of guys would get on the school bus and go to another building that had both tech where they learned their trade. What happened? <sighs> you can't have a society without men. Yeah, you got a lot of physical males right here, but they're females in their brains. And, 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 it, and also, y'all can have a, what's called a correlation between them and their relationship with the cops. Of course, the black male is a target. But this behavior... A lot of these teenage boys do. That boy is acting like, you see, like the one of these wild black females acting a fool, fighting in Miami. You know, y'all seen those videos? They're fighting in Waffle House or fighting in IHOP. That's how these black boys think they can act. But someone needs to tell them, no, you are, you are five foot nine or six foot ten black male. You can't be wailing your arms, screaming like a banshee and moving shit around. You can't do that because you're a male. They're going to shoot you. But if you're a female around here screaming and moving furniture, all it is, going like, baby, calm down. <laughs> They're going to just grab you and say, baby, get in the car. And then they can't even break them up. And that's why it's, it's kind of, it's almost like kind of scary to see. You can't even break these boys or you can't make them, hey, stop fighting, stop it. You can't. They have that rage. And I'm going to close by talk on this subject by saying this. There is an inner rage in black boys. And one of us wants to say, because of the depressions of racism. Well, Dr. John Jawaza Kanjufu talked about it in the 80s, about, the, about countering the conspiracy to destroy black boys. And, now, uh, <clears throat> and before then, Dr. Amos Wilson talked about the racism and psychological trauma uh, uh, experienced by black males in this racist society. Now we got brother Dr. T. Hassan Johnson talking about it. And we got Kwame Brown talking about it. This, of course. But one thing that I like that's being integrated into the conversation is the trauma. Thanks to this young man having this conversation with Dr. Umar Johnson. The trauma that's instilled upon black boys by their mothers. That's the rage that these boys have been suppressing. I've said this for years. I said, the reason a lot of black boys are so angry and when they get to fight with other men, they be trying to kill them because they've been told by either this, this tradition or somewhere in the religion that you ain't supposed to be mad at your mama. You ain't supposed to hit your mama. You ain't supposed to do nothing. These so many black boys want to smack the shit out of their mamas for decades. But not only with the church, the religion look down upon them, other men in the community. Man, I don't care what your mama do. I don't care what she say. They're still your mama. But it's funny. They never say, I don't care what your daddy did. I don't care if he left, he's still your daddy. Y'all see what I'm talking about? See, these boys are conflicted. They're angry at their mothers, but they know in, 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 their, in their manhood is tested and conflicted. They want to smack the shit out of them, but they know that the world will come down on them if they do that. So they take it out on society. They take it out on other boys. Let's check out a fight. These dudes be fighting to the blood. I'm like, well, damn. That extra mad? Where, where that extra anger come from? Well, that's where it comes from. Y'all go, y'all sit in the Walmarts and, and the Dollar Trees and the Krogers. How these moms be talking crazy to these boys? Y'all see it? He's ugly. This get your ass out of my face. That she's smacking him across the face. Totally de uh, dehumanizing and humiliating these boys. See, that's unnatural for women to dominate men. It's unnatural. It's against. It's against all kinds of laws. So when a mom gets to, and she say, I tried to knock him aside his head. I tried to do this. See, that's, you're not supposed to be even hitting him, mom. You're not even supposed to be hitting him. You know, that's where a father's supposed to be in there. So these moms are hitting these boys, smacking them in the face. And then you have grown-ass men say the weirdest shit. Man, I'm 40 years old. My mom still can smack the shit out of me. I find it very troubling when I hear grown ass men say this shit. Man, my mama's 70 years old, but she still can kick my ass. Are you kidding me? I know they're being funny, but even to say that is weird. That comes from a training that you owe all this homage, all this respect to your mothers because you didn't have no daddy. And I'm going to keep saying it. As one who didn't have a daddy, but I was very fortunate to have grown up in the 70s and 80s, where there was still a bunch of appropriate men in the neighborhood to help balance that out. 
But it, but see, if you respect the psychology and if you respect the God, you know what I'm talking about. A lot of y'all up in church this morning with this fake ass worship. You don't believe in God. If you did, you'd be you believe in God in the flesh. That is the black male. Come on, somebody. I'm I know I'm an illusion. If you if you as a woman, you don't teach your daughters, you don't teach other women, respect that boy. Because he's gonna grow up one day to be a husband, a protector, a provider, a hunter gatherer for you. But our women have been convinced that black men ain't nothing but somebody they can put their foot up their ass, and if, if they strike back. I can call the white zaddy police to take care of him. And black men have been convinced that they're that. Well, I don't want to mess with her. They've been made afraid of our women. I'm telling you, I'm living in a twilight zone. I've had young men tell me, and this been this gone adage, man, you don't want to make a black woman mad. You mean a motherfucker who can't even manage her own household? You mean make her mad? <laughs> no. You don't want to make somebody mad who has access to a missile, fool. You don't want to make somebody mad who, <laughs> who has access to artillery. That's who you don't want to make mad. A damn woman. You can make her mad. But see, these black boys, they think that's just against all kinds. <laughs> they, let, they sit around, they let girls hit them. They let women hit them. But a man can't brush up against you and you moving furniture with him. Y'all see how weird this shit is? Black boys. Now, country white boys like, now, go on on now. now I'm bigger than you. <laughs> you know, they'll take a few, but all that. I don't think that's cool either. Ain't nothing gentleman like that. There's nothing gentleman like about that when you allow abuse. It's the double standard. Abuse is abuse. And it's even worse because we all are built with a certain level of pride and a particular manhood that we want to protect. So you'll let a woman violate your manhood, but you but as soon as a man step up to you, oh, it's, it's on and popping. No, you, and then you're going to say, well, a woman is weaker than me. That means you need to let her know that she's weaker than you. I'm stronger than a woman. That means you need to let her know. It's Y'all know how stupid it is, how it looks. Let's say if King Kong was walking around, King Kong, y'all know King Kong, I mean, 100, 1,000 foot tall, uh, a million pounds weighing motherfucking King Kong would let an elephant punk him. Oh, you know, that's an elephant. I'm stronger than him. What I've always appreciated about those King Kong movies, that he'll, st he'll stump a mud hole in whoever it is. And that's men. You don't let no woman slap you. I don't care if, you, if she saw you cheating. You don't let no woman hit you. Are you crazy? Because can a man call you a bitch for 30 minutes? Can he? No. He can't even call you a bitch one time. But he let a woman call you that shit? Y'all crazy? No, of course, Rico got a problem with women. No, I, I'm a man. I understand the full genetic aspect, the biological aspect, and the natural selection. Come on, somebody. Of being a man. That's what men do. Men battle with other men. And men put women in their place. But see, in the black community, black women put men in their place and they stay there. Well, I said, this shit is weird. Well, you know, a man, a real man don't argue with a woman. What kind of fucking nonsense is that? She's grown just like you. And ladies, y'all should be offended by this shit. Every, but but y'all will take this convenient. Y'all accept this convenience of stupidity. This convenience of being childlike. This convenience of being a victim when it suits you. But when you're trying to fuck your, your, your peacock feathers, then, well, first of all, you're going to disrespect. Uh, you ain't going to disrespect me because I'm this, that, that. I said, oh, okay, now you want to be a strong independent when it's convenient for you. So that's what I'm saying, guys. Cut it out. Be a man. I guess... But guess who loves it when you being a man? Women. Be a man. I've seen that example growing up. The dudes are like, man, fuck these hoes. Man, I don't care about these chicks. They forget them. They can't get, women can't get enough of them. You guys are trying to cater to them and all that. <laughs> you know how it is. And I'm, of course, they're not saying all, but this is weird. So anyway, black and accountability. 
I know I threw out a whole lot of topics. I just wanted, to, I'm doing my little walk this morning. I think I may run. It's still, the weather's still nice. I don't like to just walk and not run. But anyway, y'all, please share this video. And I still, if you haven't gotten the book, it's in my, it's in the description box. Uh, it's pretty cool. It's talking about when I found out about my actual real biological father at age 22. And I got to meet him at age 39 for the first time. And it's that whole conversation. It goes in line with what we're talking about. Check me out. Cash app, you boys. It's called The Greatest Pain Ever Felt. Conversation. The conversation with my absent biological father who never wanted to be found or dared to be found. I think it's one of those. $10 cash app, $10 PayPal. It's, on the, it's in the description box. Oh, it's on this Facebook page, too, as well. Uh, please send me an email address so I can send it. It's, it's in a PDF form. But anyway, thank y'all so much for allowing me to do my 4th of July event just to share some stuff. And let's uh, get, become more familiar with the word accountability and also words like matriarchy and gynocracy and how those two words have really not been in our best interest as it relates to our race as black folks. Anyway, be cool. I'll talk to y'all later. I'm going to try to get my run on in a few minutes. But it's still no nice enough to run. It's a cool breeze out here. So anyway, y'all be cool. We'll talk later. Peace.